This is Through the Bible with Dr. William Clements. Doing ministry for 50 years, Dr. William Clements shares and teaches God's holy word because it is truly life-changing. Located in Antelope, California, you are welcome to personally come to Antelope Christian Center to hear God's word on Sundays at 9 and 11 a.m. You can also learn more about Through the Bible from anywhere you're at by logging on to our website, antelopechristian.org. And now, here's the latest teaching of Through the Bible by Dr. William Clements. My message today, the journey to the cross. Our focus and our attention found in John chapter 1 is the journey begins. The author, John the Apostle, writes to us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Word. And the Word became flesh and walked amongst mankind. Going through the Gospel of John is my strategy of preparation for the coming of Easter. I want my heart and my spirit, I want my mind and my focus to be upon the ministry of Christ, what he said and what he did, how he made the journey to Jerusalem on that historical Passover, the week we call the Passion Week, the week of suffering, the very steps of Christ as he comes to the moment of betrayal in the garden, the moment in which he is falsely accused. He is crucified on Mount Moriah, where 2,000 years earlier, Abraham would offer up his son Isaac where a thousand five hundred years before Jesus is on Mount Moriah, God would speak to Moses. And we would learn about the Passover and the blood of the Lamb on every doorpost. And a thousand years before Christ would be crucified on Calvary at Mount Moriah, how God would lead King Solomon to establish the permanent temple on the very site of Mount Moriah. The journey that takes us to Mount Moriah, the journey that takes us to Calvary, is recorded here in this gospel. And it all begins when Jesus becomes humanity. He becomes mortal man. The Bible says that Christ becomes flesh. Underscore with me the very purpose that John wrote, the Gospel of John. You'll find it at the end of the book in John chapter 20, verse 31. The core purpose of the Apostle's heart was that you and I would continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Underscore the word believe. It is used by John multiple times throughout the 21 chapters. It speaks to us about our faith. It speaks to us of discovering that Jesus is the Messiah. I speak of it as finding the Messiah. To believe and to follow Christ. The Bible tells us the very core purpose of John's gospel is that we would continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name, Jesus. Within this 21-chapter book are seven Special miracles. 
And the very core of these miracles is to establish a foundation of our faith that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that we might prepare our hearts for Easter, knowing that Christ, who gives and sacrifices his life upon the cross, is indeed the Messiah. Consider these seven miracles that begin his ministry there in Canaan, where Jesus turns water into wine. I believe these seven miracles are selected out of the multitudes of miracles Christ did. I believe they were selected by John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we might understand the very power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two categories to these seven miracles. One is power over the natural, and the second is power over sickness, disease, and death. One has to do with that realm of the supernatural manifestation of God's power in a world that has natural laws. The second category has to do with sickness and disease to the very point of death. Consider the first four miracles of Christ that deals with sickness. And when you pray for a brother or sister that is sick or ill, to be able to pray in the power of the name of Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 43, we read, when a government official asked Jesus to come pray for his very sick son, Jesus responded to the official that the very word that Christ would speak at that moment would heal his son. The official begged Christ, no, I, I don't want you to pray here. I want you to come up to my home. I want you to do what you do and you lay hands on him and he'll be healed. Jesus said, your son is already healed. And he sent the official off to his home. When he arrived at his home, he would discover that indeed his son had been healed. We're talking about the journey of the cross. We're talking about Jesus doing signs, wonders, and miracles. We're talking about the power of Christ over every sickness. What was amazing for the official is he asked those that were with his son, what time was he healed? And the Bible actually records in detail saying that it was one o'clock in the afternoon that took the breath of the officials. It just took his breath away because he realized it was one o'clock when Jesus prayed that his son would be healed. The manifestation of the power of Almighty God to have power and authority over sickness, just speaking the word. Remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And when Jesus spoke the word of healing, that son, that little boy, was instantly healed. In John chapter 5, we find the second miracle dealing with power and authority over sickness. It's a 38-year-old man, unable to walk, Seeking a miracle. And then one day he comes across Jesus. And when he meets Jesus, Jesus speaks a word to him. And that lame man is instantly healed. And he rises and he's able to walk. 
The third miracle we find in the Gospel of John is John chapter 9. And I'm speaking to you about miracles over sickness and disease. When the Pharisees spoke to the blind man who Jesus just healed, they asked him, how was this done? And the blind man said, I, I don't know how it was done. I don't understand it. I don't understand the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I can tell you this. I was blind, but now I see. We're studying the journey of Jesus all the way up to the cross where we celebrate Good Friday, where we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday, and we discover the power and the authority of Christ over sickness of a little boy, over blindness of a man, over the sickness of a man that was lame for 38 years. And just before John moves into the Passion Week, he ends the 11th chapter of three years of public ministry of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the story of Lazarus. Lazarus had been sick. They called on Christ to come and to pray for him. Mary and Martha were upset that Jesus didn't immediately come. And when Jesus arrived at the appointed moment with purpose and design in the village called Bethany, Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days. He said, take me to the tomb. Only days before Jesus would be inside his own tomb, he was standing on the outside of Lazarus' tomb. And he told those that were there, he says, I want you to roll the stone away. Isn't that something? Just a few days before they would roll the stone away, the angels would roll the stone away, and Jesus would have been risen from the empty tomb. He is in Bethany, only a few miles away from Jerusalem. And he tells the people, I want you to roll the stone of Lazarus' tomb away. They were reluctant to even be there. And they were more reluctant to roll the stone of Lazarus away. But they did as Jesus instructed and the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus stood on the, end, on the edge of that tomb and he shouted, Lazarus, come out. Power and authority over death, over disease, over sickness, over a little boy, over a blind man, over a lame man, and the power and authority to heal those that had been dead. Dead for four days. Well, actually, there are nine different, there's seven different miracles. Seven different miracles recorded by John the Apostle. Several of them had to do with healing. But the power of God is supernatural. Do you recall the very first miracle Jesus did? He changed, turned the water into wine. Some would say that's not significant. Some would say that that's not really a big thing, turning water into wine. A big thing would seeing that a blind, mi blind man could see again. A big thing would be a man that was lame for 38 years being able to walk again. Or how about a man that was dead for four days and he's resurrected from the dead? That's a big thing. John makes it very clear that we are to believe we are to believe in the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to sickness and disease and unto death. We are to believe him for the really, really big things. But we also recognize the power and authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over the smallest things in your life. 
They were at a wedding in Canaan. They had prepared wine and they served it. And then they ran out. Well, some would say that the people certainly had enough to drink. They really didn't need any more. It was not a life and death miracle. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, would turn to Christ. And Jesus said to those around serving, he said, grab those 20 gallon jugs over there. Maybe they were 30, 30 gallons. There were six of them. Six times 20 would be 120 gallons. Six times 30 would be 180 gallons. And the folks had already had enough to drink, perhaps. But nonetheless, there was a need. And in the smallest sense of a need, Jesus steps up to do the very, very supernatural. Do you know in your life the power you have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ under sickness, under disease, and unto death? Do you know that the smallest thing in your life God cares about? Do you reserve your prayer time for only that that is big? Or do you pray for the smallest thing in your life? Some would say, don't pray about that. That's not really important. But Jesus shows us everything is important. And he changes the water into wine. This is a supernatural miracle over that that is natural. It reminds me a lot of the miracle found in the Gospel of John chapter 6 where a young boy has five loaves and two fish and there Philip is saying, we don't have enough to feed these 5,000 men and women and children. Some estimate that on the hillside there were 20,000 hungry people and all we have is five loaves and two fish. Did Jesus really need to turn the water into the wine? Does Jesus really need to accept the responsibility of feeding all of these people? I can't answer that question. But I can answer this question. Jesus cares. Jesus cares and he turns the water into wine. And the host said, you've saved the best for last. That's the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't come up empty, doesn't come up short. He doesn't have a substandard. He delivers the very, very best. And don't you know the feeding of the 5,000? That was probably the best fish they've ever eaten in their life. And not one person on that hillside, not one man, not one woman, not one child left that day hungry. No, on the contrary. They were filled and the baskets left over were overflowing, leftovers, heaven's leftovers. What are we discovering about the journey to the cross? We're discovering the manifestation of the power of Almighty God through the person of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? That we might believe He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And He has power over disease and over death. And He has power supernatural power over the most natural things in our lives. John chapter 16, we come to the seventh miracle recorded in the Gospel of John. The disciples were in a small fishing boat off the shore in the Sea of Galilee, four miles out from shore, when a storm came, and they were struggling when all of a sudden, Jesus comes by. He's walking on water. A supernatural manifestation of Almighty God in the person and the work of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He steps into their boat that could easily sink in a storm. And in the twinkle of an eye, just a blink, 
They're on the other side. What do we discover about Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John? We, we, we discover his authority. We discover his power. We discover supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles when it comes to sickness, disease, and unto death. And then we discover in the realm of the natural that the wind will obey him. That 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 you have in your cupboard that that comes out of your faucet with the supernatural power of God can be changed like water into wine. We discover who Jesus is on his journey to the cross as he feeds 5,000 or he moves a small fishing boat through the storm on the Sea of Galilee. John is such a fascinating writer and he reveals to us four significant aspects about the person of Christ. He teaches us that Jesus is the light. He teaches us that Jesus is life. He reminds us, as he quotes the, the, uh, John the Baptist, that Jesus is the, is the Lamb of God. For when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, he looks up and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. John would write, God is love. John teaches us and reveals to us that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus is the life of the world, that Jesus is love, and that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Today I want to plant a seed of truth in your heart as we walk through the Gospel of John following the journey of Christ to the cross. And we understand in John chapter 1 that Jesus moves us from darkness to light. The very words we read in God's word. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish the light because Jesus is the light. You once walked in darkness. You once lived a life in darkness. And today there are millions, billions of people that are still living in darkness. But the Bible says Christ came as the light from heaven. He is the light. And he moves us from a place of darkness to a place of being in the light. And because he does that, he gives to us life. And the word gave life to everything that was created. Because you have the light of Christ inside of your heart, today you live and you live for all eternity. Jesus is the light, and Jesus is the life. I've been reading and studying John chapter 1. And one aspect that just burns within my heart is how people would find Jesus. They would come and they find Jesus. And there would be so many. There, there were men like Andrew and Peter and Nathaniel and, and Philip. All in John chapter 1. We read about men finding Christ. But I take pause and I take exception. Because I realize there are some that find Christ. But they do not follow Jesus. These I mention found Christ like John the Baptist found Christ and they would follow Jesus. Twelve are called apostles, but there were hundreds and thousands like the five thousands that Jesus fed on the hillside. They found Jesus and they would follow Jesus from city to city wherever he was teaching 
Now Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, they all decided to follow Christ. But Jesus speaks in story form about a rich young man. And he tells the rich young man how to have eternal life. And when he hears this, he stumbles. For Jesus says to him, there is still one thing you must do. You must let everything go. You must sell everything and then come follow me. That's what Andrew did. That's what Peter did. That's what Philip did. That's what Nathaniel did. That's what Saul did when he became the apostle Paul. He followed Christ. He surrendered everything to Christ. But the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 16, in Luke chapter 18, verse 22, that this young rich man became very sad for he would not be willing to let all of his riches go. He would not sell and surrender everything to Christ. The Bible tells us in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. And my sheep follow me. As we take the journey to the cross, we recognize, I understand that you know that you have found the Messiah. You believe in Jesus. But I ask you, I ask you this Easter, are you following the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered your life to Him? Easter is finding Christ. Easter is following Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Thank you for joining us as we go through the Bible with Dr. William Clements. Easter is coming soon, and we're excited to share with you Dr. William Clement's new series, Journey to the Cross. We invite you to join us by reading a chapter each day in the Gospel of John with Dr. William Clements, all the way up until the blessed Easter Sunday. You can join us by going on to our website, antelopechristian.org. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you that Jesus is our message and people are our heart. Going on, Lord, you know what's going on in the corners of my mind.